Good to be with you here once again at Midweek Manna. Again, we are studying from the book or the letter of Romans. Uh, let me take just a moment to remind you again, just a couple simple things because of the technologies. Um, I'd like for you to just, you know, put in there that you like this when you get the opportunity. Um, make your comments there. And something else uh, brought to my attention that would help. You know, I know because of, of uh, life going on, and sometimes since we're not sitting in a church building together in a Bible study format or preaching service uh, with Midweek Manna, you typically you're at your home. You may have other responsibilities. The phone may ring. Uh, you may have to answer the door. You may remember something. Just allow this uh, to, to view for the entire time. You know, if you are on your phone and you switch over and forget to get back or you can't get back or all these things, those algorithms mean something uh, to the technology. So again, I, I trust you're enjoying. I know life happens uh, and uh, no harm, no foul. But uh, another thing too, you know, talk it up. If you are enjoying uh, this format, if you are enjoying Midweek Manna, talk to somebody else about it and just say, hey, I'd like to share this with you, uh, or at least talk to them and get them to sign on. Uh, if we can pick up, you know, more listeners, it just helps getting it out to more and more people. Uh, for example, I've, I've talked to some people even about our uh, Midweek Prayer Meeting and again, because they may hear it and then forget about it by me just simply mentioning to them about the seven o'clock on Wednesday nights in-person prayer meeting. And they're like, oh yeah, I meant to come. And then they do come. So again, just personal reference uh, really goes a long way. Uh, we're continuing to do midweek manna, even though the, uh, the virus um, at this particular time has settled, we're seeing more and more people return uh, for worship on the weekends. As far as the other world I live in, transportation, I'm actually seeing some students get back on the bus that have not been on a bus or in a classroom in over a year. So, you know, it's just been a different time, and we all know it. Uh, however, the Lord has been faithful to help us, and uh, so... You just got to flex with the times. The, the main ingredient is we remain in the Word of God. So if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 1, we're going to continue uh, with this great letter that Paul wrote. Uh, again, each time I just want to share just, just a reminder, comment, that this is a, a different type of letter than any of his other letters, and it really serves as a modern day thesis uh, about Christianity as a whole. So uh, he's not writing to personal friends or a church that he's established. And, and you hear some of that kind of language. With that in mind, uh, let's read together Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and verse 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, again, since we're just picking up where we've left off, you notice the first words we read today is for this reason. Well, what's that reason? Uh, it goes back to verse 25, which was last week's study, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So, you know, when we read this, if you have never read the Bible for yourself, if you've never heard a scripture in your life being read or recited or shared from somebody else, 
and you would hear that wording, you would think, oh, that must be modern uh, news. That must be something that the tabloids are using, something that the newspapers, something that uh, media resources are speaking about. Because you see, we're still there, aren't we? Now, for this Roman world, again, remember, Paul's writing to them, never been there, and it is kind of the apex of the entire globe. You know, this powerful nation, the most powerful nation on the planet at that time, and to be able to get to Rome, it's kind of like that Wizard of Oz mentality. If I could just get the, you know, Oz. And uh, so here they, he's been sharing about the gospel, and he's talking about the effect when the gospel is not around what people do to themselves. The wording that they exchanged, that man has exchanged um, truth for whatever he wanted to fit in the same space. Of course, Paul used the word lie. Uh, so the world that he was speaking to, and we're going to do our parallels in just a minute, was a world that was filled with shame. Uh, and so again, as I make these next comments, it's echoing what we're dealing with right now in a woke culture, because right and wrong were being twisted. It was being confused. Uh, that which was evil was being called good, and that which was good was be called, being called evil. I, I wrote down some things that I came across that, <laughs> wow. Uh, again, describing Rome at that time, a man by Properitus. He was a poet. This is what he wrote. I see Rome, proud Rome, perishing, the victim of her own prosperity, an age of moral suicide. Another writer of that time, his name was Juvenal. Juvenile was a satirist, of course, with his satire. And um, this was his comment. Again, it's satire, so it's going to be dark. The earth no longer brings forth any but bad men and cowards. Hence, God, whoever he is, looks down, laughs at them, and hates them. So, again, of the time, individuals who were not Christian, who were not God-fearers, are looking at just the culture, looking at humanity, and saying, oh my goodness, what has happened to us? We're, not, we're no longer able to define things. Uh, again, look at the pressure of the day. Right now, we're watching a nominee to go on to this nation's most powerful court in the land, the Supreme Court of the United States. And this is a woman, and I use that term, not loosely, this woman who is being, of course, nominated and being uh, asked, you know, some moderate questions to strong questions, was asked by another woman, would you define the word woman? The nominee simply says, after a few choking uh, motions, I cannot. Again, ask, you cannot define the word woman. And again, the nominee comes back, doesn't know what else to say, and said, I'm not a botanist. Wow. If something like this would have happened even 10 years ago, it would have hit not only the late night news, but, but of course, all the sitcoms. These, the night uh, TV hosts would just mock and rail and laugh. But this is where our culture is now. We're walking on eggshells. We don't know how to communicate one to another anymore. You, you can't say, uh, you can't use pronouns of he and she uh, you just have to use they. Uh, you're not able to comment by just the natural eye 
looking at a form and commenting, that's a man or that's a woman. You're not allowed to do that. And of course, today, just the, uh, the hate speech uh, that happens as a result. Again, it's exactly what Rome was dealing with itself. Now, it paralleled with the quagmire of, of emotions and every whatever was happening, no one was allowed to comment anymore. And they were trying everything they could in every capacity of life. They also were an extremely luxurious country, um, city, uh, uh, region. And of course, it, the luxury was crazy. Um, the uh, and again, going back just to a little history, the bathhouses that the Romans were well known for uh, just became so opulent that uh, now the faucets, uh, the spigots uh, for their hot and cold waters, um, were made of silver. Um, I had the privilege. Um, in Israel to see, of course, uh, a city that had been destroyed by an earthquake and the ruins there of a Roman bathhouse. And of course, the, you know, the wooden floors were gone, but how uh, they would heat those pools and you could still see all the irrigation back then, how they brought water in under the floor and how they heated and how they cooled water. And it just gave you that imagery of what we've seen on old TV sets and, and movie sets. Well, as we now have that in our mind, you know, they just kept trying to think of how can we make it even more excessive uh, and flaunt uh, our wealth. Again, we see the parallels to this day. Um the uh, Caligula, of course, of Rome, uh, was so caught up in the excesses that instead of using sawdust on the floors, they would use gold dust on the floors. Yeah, we've, we've got wealth to waste and to burn. Um, so they were filled with um, just uh, opulence and, and, and extreme wealth. Uh, they had more money than they could imagine. Uh, they were, and it caused them to become, of course, obviously very prideful. They got into their excesses and they got into their indulgences. Uh, along with this became a time of unparalleled immorality. Um, and of course, uh, going back to the history books, uh, this was a very interesting note for Rome. There had not been a single case of divorce in the first 520 years of the Roman Republic. First 520 years. Think about that span of time. And uh, twice the age of the United States of America. You think about that time, not the single recorded case of divorce. And then like flipping a switch, once it started, here was the comment that they, their women were married in order to be divorced and they were divorcing in order to be married. In other words, it had no value any longer. It's just what is convenient in the moment and uh, to get ourselves in position for more wealth or power, I need to marry into this, or I, I need to uh, go through a public divorce to get positioned uh, so that I may speak to this group. And it just shows the deterioration of what they once knew uh, to what they had become. This is also interesting. Of course, you had Agrippa, and uh, his, of course, daughter, who was married to Caligula, her name was, of course, Agrippina, Agrippina, Ina, excuse me. And she, of course, in her extreme 
um, position of power and prestige. You can't make this stuff up. She would leave her home at night and go down to a local brothel and participate in those activities all night, all night long just for the sheer pleasure of lust. This is Caligula's wife. There were people involved in those activities. They knew exactly who there was. The word went out. They didn't have to have social media. They didn't have to have uh, any newspapers promoting that, just by word of mouth. This is the picture of deterioration that was going on. And so we want to use a word here. Everything had become unnatural. Uh, so this is why Paul writes this letter. He wants to come to Rome. He knows believers are there. He wasn't a part of establishing this particular church. Again, the belief is that um, there had been those Jews who had made their way to Jerusalem for Pentecost, and now the biblical record of the day of Pentecost, as we refer, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, uh, had affected uh, every region of the globe uh, as people went back and shared the experience of the promise that now they were living in, of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And so here Paul is writing this letter saying, I want to come to you. It is my desire to do that. These are our times. And now we go back to a verse we've already read. Uh, again, we're still in chapter 1, but in verse 16, you've probably memorized it. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile the barbarian, those who aren't born Jewish. I hope that uh, before we go on, that we really kind of take that in. Because uh, before we go to the next uh, few verses to read, and that's where we'll complete today, uh, I, we've already made a few comments. You've already had thoughts uh uh, with my comments, and you've gone ahead and you're thinking of, oh my goodness, yes, uh, this is what I'm hearing from my daughter, that from my son, my grandchildren. This is what my children, my grandchildren say that their peers are saying. Uh, this is what I'm seeing on my tablet. This is what I'm seeing on my monitor. Uh, as I Google this, this pops up. And so our minds are immersed in what Rome was dealing with then, we're dealing with now. The, the luxury that is flaunted of the Hollywood types and their lifestyles, the lavishness of their lifestyles to excess and just absurdities and, and the, uh, the abuse of the blessings and the wealth that they have accrued. Yes, pretenses in many cases of some small humanitarian effort, and yet still flaunting just the excesses on within the immorality and just anything goes. And then the pressure to keep up with all of that, to be able to tolerate it, to be able to accept it, and then, of course, then to promote it and to live it. And we're feeling that pressure right now. And this is why Paul says, but remember the gospel. The gospel is what has the power. The gospel is the power that says you don't have to bow to the spirit of the age. You don't have to get involved in these shameful lifestyles. Oh, but I, 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 I can't take a position. I can't comment. I can't afford that. I'll, I'll, I'll lose my career. I'll, I'll lose my pension. I'll lose my position. And we're feeling the same pressure today. And hey, there's no denying many people right now who have taken st stands for righteousness are being persecuted. And it's only going to increase. We know the day in which we live. We know the return of our Lord cannot be that far away. We are feeling it. 
as we're doing this Bible study together, we can hear the, the beating of war drums around this globe. Our, now, our focus right now is Russia and Ukraine, and yet Belarus is in position to join with the uh, Russians. We hear activity. We hear the, you know, the swords, the sabers uh, being rattled against each other uh, as we hear comments coming out of North Korea, as we, as we hear the comments uh, from China, uh, and, and the list just goes on. This world is teetering. We know, we know that there is this disturbance. For now, a good 20 years, we hear the comment, new world order. We've heard it often enough now, and those that may be watching, or if they're not, your children, grandchildren that are in their 20s uh, and younger, this is all they've ever heard in their entire life of a new world order. And of course, it's being spun to where this is what we want. Let's forget everything in the past. Utopia is just ahead. And those that want to keep us from getting there, we're going to terminate them. We're going to let them get out of the way. We're going to force them out of the way because they've been foolish. You know, we've, we've talked about uh, the war to end all wars multiple times, and yet here we are. So what's it going to take to get to utopia? We're going to have to do a major reset. And so we're hearing now and we're feeling now in that reset the pressure of the economy, global currencies. What's it going to take to unify the planet? You see, the Bible has been telling us that there will be a system put in place that the globe will have to respond to or be squashed because we no longer will tolerate those who resist that you're going to lose your wealth overnight if you don't transfer over. And so what is that? Are we talking about digital monies, the Bitcoins and, and all these different things? And for many of us, it sounds so confusing. For others already joining in, just whatever it takes, I don't want to lose my wealth. Somewhere in the not too distant future, people will lose their entire life savings like that. When it comes to global travel, we've, we've now been indoctrinated with vaccinations that will be mandatory to be able to travel. And again, we can talk about the good side, the positive things of that. But the bigger thing is, that's, that's not what we're debating here. We're getting conditioned of what it's going to take for the planet to see themselves as one. We can no longer afford, in the mindset of a new world order, to have all these different countries under all these different leaders, under all these different currencies, all these different policies. No. We're going to unify the planet because when we do, we're going to have utopia. When we do that and we're all doing the same thing, we're going to eradicate disease. We're going to eradicate death itself. We're going to be able to, and we hear the socialistic language, we're going to make it so perfect and so even everybody will be treated the same. This is what already has been tested more than once. You know, we talk about the birth pangs. These birth pangs we're feeling now globally, man, they're, they're major birth pangs. And again, with our inflationary costs right now, things that the discomfort that it brings, we, we, uh, we fuss and, and we get irritated. But where is it going? Well, along with that is this immoral landslide of we know we're going to be silenced. We're going to be silenced. We understand Scripture tells us there's coming a time that those who are believers will pay the ultimate sacrifice. 
if they will not bow to this. So I, I trust as we're reading these scriptures that we just start once again letting it truly speak to us and not just do study to the point of getting a little bit more knowledge of history, but to understand it is truly speaking to us now. And those of us that have some age and we have another generation or a couple or three generations coming up behind us that we still have uh, the privilege of speaking to, whether it's your biological family, your family tree, or just the positions that you hold in society that these other generations do like you and love you and respect you enough to at least listen to you. We got to come back to truth and not afford to exchange truth for a lie. Let's go on now and read verses 28 through 32. It gets a little more threatening and speaks spot on where we are now for sure. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. They are slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Wow. You know, as I read this again, I'm I have to remind myself when this letter was written and the purpose of the letter. It was an introduction letter of the gospel. It was being sent to those who already were believers, but Paul wanted to be able to speak into their life and educate them more, deepen their experience, and wanted them to get motivated to realize they weren't just a few by themselves, and that's the way it was going to stay, that the gospel needed to be promoted so that every ear would hear, that it would reach every, every hamlet, every city, every community. The time in which this letter was written, these people were in a very indulgent society. We've already brought that fact out. And then we get into... What happens when you leave God out of things? And we got to know. We got to know the United States of America is following that same pattern. We're the generation that saw prayer taken out of schools. We are the generation that have watched Ten Commandments in any kind of form removed from the public eye in many of our public places that once you know, our courthouses that once easily embraced them. When you start removing God, got to know that something else is going to fill that void. We look now and our crime rates continue to escalate. Today, the division of people. And it isn't just on the news at night we wonder, I don't know, wonder if in my lifetime I'll ever come across that situation myself. We all see it all the time now. The, the division of people and the extent in which they express it. And again, no longer is it just, well, you just need to be quiet and we'll all get along. Oh no, that, that roaring lion is vicious now. The, the wording we just read there, Again, when you leave God out, uh, it, it not only brings the judgment of God upon people practicing unrighteousness, 
In reality, people are bringing judgment on themselves. Now, again, in the heat of battle, and if you are put in position with whomever, as a pastor, as a preacher preaching the gospel, and you make that public declaration from the Word of God, oh, immediately, coming against it. No, 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 no. And you're trying to explain, wait a minute, you're, you're hating me right now because of what's happening to you. And we try to come back, but you've done this to yourself. Oh, no, I, I, I can't take responsibility. i got to blame somebody else. And again, if we don't even acknowledge God, then who are we going to take it out on? We're going to take it out on you. You know, we're hearing reports out of Canada, out of Europe, some cases in the United States, of ministers being, of course, uh, jailed. We have heard, uh, uh, you know, multiple, multiple stories and, and keeps getting confirmations that when we talk about martyrs, those who've lost their life because they stood up for the gospel, we thought that was just biblical language way back then. There are more martyrs today than any time in recorded history. But again, we've been shielded. And again, that's why this letter speaks to us of a community that had become so blessed that they went into excesses, they lost their charity, and now became boastful and prideful. And again, the excesses, which caused them then to slip over into immoral things. And so we want to go into our indulgences to see just how wild and crazy we can get and to experience everything going on. Here, it is very obvious what the Bible is saying. But oh man, this is a line of demarcation today to read from Romans chapter one, that women were with women doing what seems to be totally unseemingly possible. Why would they even want to do that? And men having passion, burning passion, one for another, instead of the natural bent that they would want to have that passion with a woman. Oh, man, this is war now. You can't say those things. You can't speak those things. But we're quoting God's eternal word, the truth of God's word. And that's why truth itself is under attack. You Christians don't have a right to say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You're the ones that are haters. You're the ones that have pulled away from the pack. You're the ones that just say it has to be your way or no way. And yet we're just standing on the word of God. You know, my whole life, we've talked about the rapture of the church. And we've talked about what it would be like if we miss the rapture and remain on the earth. Now, again, remember the words of Jesus. It says there's coming a time. We know it throughout Scripture is Jacob's trouble, a seven-year period of time of tribulation, known as the lesser th tribulation for half that time and the greater tribulation, the latter half of that seven-year period. Daniel saw it. In, in, we have in the Old Testament. John the Revelator saw it in the New Testament. Jesus spoke of these times. And it's Jesus who said, there's never been, nor never will be again, like those days. Now we're building up to those days. But it still shakes us to our core to think how evil someone can become. And again, we know we're born in sin, shaped in this iniquity. But you see, the word evil means, in the Greek, the opposite of justice. Not the opposite of good, per se, the opposite of justice. And that uh, justice is defined to the Greeks as giving to God and giving to man what is their just due? So when you say evil, 
then if it's the opposite of justice, then you are not giving to God his due, nor people. Sound familiar? The thief has come to steal, to kill, to destroy. The great thief. It all ties in with the evil one. And when there is an evil one, an antichrist leader leading a a godless regime that is empowered for a season to establish an antichrist lawless community that is the this demands are to be global we have no idea just how immoral this thing really is going to become. And the the wording here of like villainy, it's not just badness, it is deliberate. Uh, Inventors of evil. In other words, sitting back, hmm, just how evil was so-and-so did that evil act and got credit for it. I'll go a step further. And just studying evil, practicing it on individuals. Uh, We think back to the Second World War, Nazi Germany. The final solution, again, trying to get to a utopian age at that time. We're going to raise up the perfect race. You see, and yet we live in a time now, don't talk about history, don't talk about history, The cancel culture says, "Uh uh-uh, we don't want anything about the past being spoke any longer. It says, if it is eradicated, you don't have a right to speak about it. And yet, there are these birth pangs. But it's leading up, again, as you share this study and share your own commentary from the Word of God, uh, again, when we think of, uh, of viciousness, the word viciousness I mean, you think about what you think that word means. But viciousness, in its full definition, means the removal of any quality of good. So when we think about viciousness, typically we think, oh, boy, they're they're kind of they're they're kind of out there. No, they're all the way out there, devoid of good. And so when we think about Satan. You know, so many times we think, well, you know, maybe he'll give me a break. No, he don't know how to give me a break. He's evil. When we think about Antichrist, when we think about lawlessness, again, this is what we've got to get in our spirit. It means the removal of good, that there is no hope for good. And we're going to move you out of the way to establish what we want. And you can call us vicious if you want to. It doesn't matter. We're in charge. You see, this is the spirit that is prevalent upon the earth, and it is growing every single day. I'll I'll finish with this. It's murder and strife and slander, whisperers, (laughs) slanderers, braggarts, arrogant, and pitiless. Oh, my. So, again, as we conclude this study, Again, the purpose of the gospel, this is where we're going to conclude today. We must embrace the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what the price is, no matter what the persecution may become, it is the power of God unto salvation. They that endure to the end, they shall be saved. You see, this thing is serious. It's always been serious, but we've had to be reminded and here we are living in a time that is, is, is eroding very quickly, right before our very eyes. And you just got to know how much work of evil is being, has already been done and established. The trap door can open at any time. The floodgate can open up at any time. That which we've known we thought would never leave will evaporate. Are you ready? Is Jesus Christ Lord? Does your family know that? As again, we talk about already history of evil and what it meant and how they they lost their city, how they lost their country, 
how they lost their way of life because they imploded. America, we better pay attention. Let's pray together. It's a heavy word today, Lord, and yet it's truth. And we know this, that you're faithful to your people, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. But we better get, grasp the truth and the reality of the moment, especially to speak to the younger generations that they cannot bow to the bail of this world. They cannot bow to the spirit of the age, but they must do a full surrender, not a partial mindset of I'll, 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 I want some of Jesus. No, we got to sell out. we got to surrender our lives to you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for your word because it is that which will get us through this hour, and ultimately we will be in your fullness of presence for an eternity. So keep us in that truth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Until next time, God bless.